Welcome to the AAC Report, Monday, April 1st. I'm Jeff Allen. Coming up on today's show, we'll talk about Ron Hunter taking the reins at Tulane for the men's basketball program. J.P. Gooderham of the fearthewave.com site will join us to discuss that. He is standing by in the virtual green room. But first, let's cover some other matters in the women's Final Four, UConn has made their way back there. The second-seeded Huskies beat top seed Louisville 80-73. to Katie Lou Samuelson still recovering from back issues late in the season. You know she missed the entire AAC tournament. She struggled in the prior UCLA game, but she scored 29 to lead the way as the Cardinals kept rallying. Katie Lou says it takes the whole team. You know, we are at our best when we're working together, and that's just the team we are. And, um, you know, we weren't necessarily doing that. Um, We weren't getting the right screens, the right shots for the right people in the right situations. And so, um, you know, we know that, and yet it seems like it comes out in these types of moments. And so we really have to believe it, I guess, and really understand that we can't do it alone, this team specifically. So, like I said, we'll see what... Um, you know, we'll watch the game, figure out all that stuff. Coach Gino Ariyama has his team back for a 12th consecutive Final Four, but as a two-seed, you know, that's not an April Fool's joke. They're, they're a two-seed. Having been knocked out in the semis the last two years, he says this team is not the usual standard. Well, I said before the season starts, this isn't typical UConn team. So people are starting to get used to the idea that I was right. Yeah, we're human. We kind of suck this year, to be honest with you. And we need to get better. Of course, they suck their way all the way to the Final Four. Come on, Gino. You just won a game. You're in the Final Four. Lighten up a little bit. Just a little bit. UConn awaits the winner of the Stanford-Notre Dame game that will be played on Monday evening. Turning to the men's side. Houston's run in March Madness ended against Kentucky in the Sweet 16. Down 11 at the half, the Cougs rallied behind Armani Brooks in his sharpshooting three-pointers. They had the lead late, but it slipped away. The Wildcats won that game 62-58 to before getting eliminated by Auburn in the Elite Eight. Wichita State, they're in the NIT Final Four. They will play Lipscomb in one of the semifinals on Monday evening. And also on Monday, South Florida hosts DePaul in the CBI Championship, which is a best of three. Game two will be at DePaul on Wednesday and also for Game three Friday if necessary. The college coaching carousel finds Ron Hunter taking the reins at Tulane for the fired Mike Dunleavy. Let's find out more from this conversation I had last week. Now joining us on the program to talk about the coaching change of the basketball program at Tulane, J.P. Goodrum of FearTheWave.com. He covers everything involving Tulane athletics. J.P., how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. It's an exciting day for Tulane fans, I think, so uh, very happy to be here and talk about what we're thinking. Yes, so let's start with uh, why the coaching change took place. Uh, just 24 wins in three seasons for Mike Dunleavy, only four this season, winless in the conference. What did not work for for Mike Dunleavy? You know, it's, it's a tough one, because I think if you just go through the numbers, you really hit the nail on the head, which is that at the end of the day, he did not win while he was in Uptown New Orleans. And, you know, everyone around the program, I think there was a lot of excitement when Mike Dunleavy was hired. He obviously had the pedigree of being the 1998 uh, NBA Coach of the Year. He, you know, was expected to recruit a high profile of player. But in the end, you know, there was a combination of really, from a basketball philosophy standpoint, we weren't doing that much to maximize the talent that we did have. And on top of that, from a recruiting standpoint, we weren't really bringing in the Jimmy Heat against uh, the mid and top tier teams of the AAC. So the decision was made to go in a different direction, and the new hire was announced today. And we'll talk about Ron Hunter's arrival in a second, but another quick question on Dunleavy. He was a decorated NBA coach. Was he able to relate to college players? I think that was a challenge. I mean, I, I think that there's it's tough because there were some positive signs that, that we could look to. A good example is that Tulane historically has not sent many NBA players, you know, from 
our graduating classes and whatnot. And last year, not one but two Tulane players end up making it to the NBA. Of course, Melvin Frazier, who was drafted by the Orlando Magic, and then uh, Cam Reynolds signed a multi-year deal with the Minnesota Timberwolves. So you look at that and you think, okay, well, you know, there's a story here. And a story might be, look, if you come to Tulane, Dunleavy's going to develop you into this next level of player. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, that team that had those two NBA talents still only won five games in conference. So, you know, I think that, that he had an energy for the program. I really believe he wanted to make it happen. But I think maybe more so on uh, the execution of, of getting those high-profile guys in and, and really getting the, the type of recruits that can let you be competitive in a league as good as this. And also, shout out, I forgot to say this, but, uh, you know, shout out to, to UCF for what they did in the tournament. This is a good league, and, you know, it's very different from being a good Conference USA team or something like that. You got to be good, and you got to be able to compete at the national level. And we need a coach who can help make that happen. And now Ron Hunter is on the scene, a man that led Georgia State to three NCAA tournaments, and will forever be in March Madness lore for falling off the stool with his injured Achilles while his son RJ was making a clutch shot. People are very excited, and for anyone, I think that's probably for at least if you're like me, the first thing you thought of when you you talk about Ron Hunter is going to be that game, right, and, and falling off uh, the stool and just being so excited as Georgia State, I believe they beat Baylor in the first round of the tournament that year. Mm-hmm. But you fast forward, and what's interesting, they were back in the tournament this year. They lost in the first round to Houston. And despite the fact that this guy turned Georgia State, which very similarly to Tulane, was a doormat in the Sun Belt, he turned into a very competitive program that's been to the NCAA tournament three times in the past five years. And nonetheless, and this is actually very similar to what happened with our head football coach, Willie Fritz, he's in an athletic department that, to be blunt, seems pretty bad. And they don't offer him an extension. He doesn't have stability in his situation. So he finds his way to Tulane. Now, on our side, you look at the, you know, the debate that I've been having online, you know, with a a few folks, there's a, a certain portion of people who kind of are of the opinion, Tulane is bad at this and they're always going to be bad. And I don't fault anyone for having that skepticism, but the argument that I make is that if you look at the hires Tulane has brought in in basketball, there has been no one like this. Now, Dunleavy, of course, was a head coach, but he had no college experience before that. We had a few guys who had been assistants at high major programs like a Maryland or a Kentucky, but there was no one like Ron Hunter who had been at not just Georgia State, but IUPUI and had experienced building a program from the ground up. And I think that Tulane fans are very justified to be excited because finally Tulane seems like they are seriously at an institutional level committed to winning and investing the kind of money that you need to get the kind of coaches who can succeed at this level. So we're very excited. Ron Hunter certainly has the if factor. He's charismatic, good on TV from working tournaments on Turner when he hasn't been in the dance, and is also good with the media. It's, I, I think that if you look at Tulane, and I think if you're for any school that is situated in a city, and especially in a city, you know, I think Orlando fans probably have familiarity. You know, you have a lot of people in your neighborhood who probably have FSU or UF stickers on. To get attention, you, you need two things, right? You need to win, first and foremost. But when you have a coach who can really stump for the program, it means a lot. And if you watch his interviews, guys, this, this guy is, like, pure energy. And I think that, especially if he gets this thing going, I mean, just like his opening press conference was today, and the New Orleans media, which largely does not care about Tulane basketball, was all over it. There was a second-line parade to bring him in. He gets up and he says, look, my goal isn't to be competitive next year. My goal is to take an 0-18 team and take them to the NCAA tournament. That is my expectation. And he is just, you know, he's going to roll up and he, he, uh, he, you know, he's willing to talk the talk and, and we think he can walk the walk. And if he can do those two things, uh, this could be a, a turning point. And that's what we certainly hope. Well, taking an 0-18 team in conference is definitely a big challenge to take on. What, time, what kind of team is he inheriting and, uh, and what, what pieces does he have to work with? Well, you know, like any coaching change, this is going to be a question mark. Now, I'll, I'll operate on, on what we know so far. 
There have been no announced transfers since the Levy's firing, which happened a little more than a week ago, so that certainly could still happen. If the core stays intact, uh, Tulane, unfortunately this year, was number 322 in Ken Pomeroy's experience metric. The good news of that is that you now have all these freshmen like Kevin Zhang, Moses Wood, uh, who are now potentially coming back to Tulane with a year under their belt. There's also a former four-star recruit who played for Seton Hall who he did his sitting out transfer year last season who, if he sticks around, I think could be a really talented point guard. So it's certainly up in the air. Um, You know, I think the the first big thing, and and this is what we were at the uh, athletic director, Troy Dannon's presser when the Levy's firing was announced, and he said the first step of this process is you are a recruiter and you're recruiting the kids who are already on the team. And so I think the first step is there are some, some really, I, I think, interesting guys in that core. And if Turner can really make his pitch to them and say, I'm a guy who can help you here, uh, Tulane, I think, could. I don't think this is a death penalty situation necessarily. I think, uh, you know, he could potentially get it going sometime in the, the near future. And of course, with that excitement with uh, with with basketball, and of course, you know, getting good news like this during March Madness probably does not hurt as well. Um, let me ask you a quick question about the football team because uh, you know spring practice going on. Um, you know, the Green Wave coming off of a, a season where they showed some improvement. They uh, finished out the season with a curable victory here in Orlando. Um, what 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 do you think about their prospects uh, going into uh, the, into the season this year? I think there's a lot of optimism around Tulane football. Uh, you mentioned it, but they're coming off their first bowl win since 2002. And I think what's exciting is that they closed strong. They had to win the final game of the season against Navy. They ended up getting it done. They played the Raging Cajuns of ULL, and uh, it really was a beatdown, you know, at, uh, at the Cure Bowl. And, and so I think that gives us a, a lot of excitement going into this year. But I think what has gone well for Tulane really in the last two years is that the defense has outperformed expectations. But meanwhile, offensively, it's been a stagnant team at times. And I think that's been something that even with some real talent on that side of the ball, it hasn't felt like we've unlocked that full capacity. In comes Will Hall, the new offensive coordinator. I had him on my podcast last week. I'm like pretty stoked about what he can do. I mean, if you, if for people who are familiar at all with Tulane football, we were trying to follow a model that was closer to a, a triple option team, a run heavy offense that slows the game down, that burns clock, that limits possessions. Will Hall, who came in, I asked him, who are the coaches today who either influence you or you look at and, and you really think their style is pretty good? And instantly he pointed to teams like Notre Dame to Scott Frost UCF. And we're going to see a more up-tempo Green Wave football team this year that I think can be pretty exciting, especially with a, a number of really effective running backs coming back. Then on top of that, a wide receiver named Jalen McCleskey, who is top 10 all-time for receptions at Oklahoma State. He's come home now to play for his dad, who is on staff. And I think there's a, there's a lot of really good players in those skill positions and we're excited to see what Hall can do and potentially to set the bar higher than what we had last year. Well, I'll tell you what, never, never ever too early to talk football, right? Uh, uh, JP, you've got some uh, shameless plugs for, uh, for Fear the Wave you want to give for us? Sure, yeah, of course. If you want to follow us, uh, we're, we're at Fear the Wave blog on Twitter. We're Fear the Wave on Facebook. We talk about Tulane stuff. We have a lot of good AAC banners, so... Yeah, if you're interested, come check it out. But thank you very much for having me on your show. I appreciate it. All right, J.B. Kudaram with the fearofthewave.com. Thanks again for your time. So the AAC has a new coach come in. Will we possibly, on the hoop side, see a couple go out? Kelvin Sampson of Houston is a target of Arkansas. It's said that he's been offered $3 million a year for six years to stay as the Cougars' headband, and that would actually match what Greg Marshall makes at Wichita State. We'll see what happens there. Johnny Dawkins was in the mix at Vanderbilt, according to sources, but that was over a week ago, and it's been somewhat quiet since then. It is also anticipated that uh, UCF Athletic Director Danny White would certainly uh, pony up the money to keep Johnny Dawkins in Orlando. Some other news and notes from around the American. 
Turning to baseball, Player of the Week announced Hunter Goodman, freshman DH outfielder from Memphis, hit 592 with seven RBIs, two home runs, 938 slugging percentage on the week to lead the Tigers in a series win over Houston. He had at least one base knock in each game, including three multi hit games. The pitcher of the week was Jake Agnes from ECU, the lefty, tied a career high with 11 strikeouts to six scoreless innings and a 4 0 series opening win Friday at USF. Surrendered only three hits and recorded at least one strikeout in all six innings, including multiple Ks in the first, second, and third frames. And making the weekly honor roll, Grant Sherman, the left-hander from UCF, threw a complete game Friday night in a 2-1 to one series opening win over UConn, scattering four hits and just one walk to lead off the ninth, struck out forward his first complete game as a, as a knight in a uh, epic battle if you will, with uh, Mesa Violi from UConn. The game it was a tight pitcher's duel, lasted only one hour and 58 minutes. That's pretty incredible for uh, for college baseball. So as we talk about the uh, standings in baseball, ECU, the 14th-ranked Pirates, leading the way in conference with a 6-0 record, 21-6 overall. UConn is in second place, 4-2 and in the conference, 17-9 overall. Tulane and Wichita State both 2-1 and one in conference play for baseball. And in women's softball, UCF is leading the way undefeated in the conference at 6-0, 26-9 overall. Tulsa at 5-1, 24-10 overall. And USF is holding on the third spot in the standings at 4-2, 26-14 and overall is where the standings are with the top ones there. And last week, it was announced the new 12-year uh, media rights deal between the American and ESPN. That's going to uh, increase uh, payments for the schools up to uh, roughly uh, uh, $7 million per year. And uh, I had a chance to interview Mike Oresco, the commissioner of the American Athletic Conference. And you can hear that over on Nightline on a special segment, Nightline Now. You can check that out anytime that podcast is posted and ready for you to check out. I want to thank you for listening to this edition of the AAC Reports. Don't forget, you can follow me on Twitter at Jeff Allen underscore 88 and check out my personal podcast at JeffAllenSportsTalk.com. Thanks for listening.